Luke chapter 2. And really, um, what I, I forgot to mention this on Sunday, but we've, the, the entire series is called Hope. And the first five parts of that were Hope Announced. And then this past Sunday and tonight's is Hope Arrived, because we were looking at the anticipation of hope, Jesus being that hope, uh, arriving, and then tonight, last Sunday and tonight, we actually see that Jesus has arrived on the scene, hope has arrived, and tonight we're looking at part seven of that, and we'll get some confirmation. His parents will get some confirmation, we'll get some confirmation that all of this has really happened, this is all of these incredible things, and we'll get that confirmation in two ways, through prophecy and through preaching. Prophecy has been a big part of just the whole Christmas story. Uh, from the Old Testament, from Genesis chapter 3, and on throughout the Old Testament, all the prophecies that were telling uh, everybody, announcing to, 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 uh, to God's people, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. And uh, even uh, Elizabeth and um, uh, her husband Zacharias and Joseph and Mary and so many others getting those prophecies. So it's a big part. And tonight we see that even after his birth, there's still prophecy concerning him. And uh, so we'll, we'll look at those um, uh, tonight. So um, it, the year 1809, the year 1809 does not sound significant to any of us probably, but it was the year in 1809 was the year that Napoleon at the time was sweeping through Austria. Blood was flowing freely. And at that time, nobody cared too much about babies. The world at the time, though, was overlooking some terribly significant births. In 1809, as, as Napoleon is making his way across Austria and conquering uh, city by city, um, William Gladstone was born that year. You may think, well, who in the world is William Gladstone? He was destined to become one of England's finest statesmen. That same year, Alfred Tennyson was born to an obscure minister and his wife. He would grow up to one day greatly affect the literary world. He was a writer and a poet, Alfred Tennyson, wonderful poet. Uh, on the American continent, Oliver Wendell Holmes was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Not far from him, Edgar Allan Poe, as strange as he was, uh, began his eventful and tragic life. It was also in that same year, 1809, that a physician named Darwin and his wife named their child Charles Robert Darwin. Everybody knows about Darwin, and not that we care for his philosophy on life or what he taught, but still uh, he was going to make a huge impact, that little infant. Uh, at that, that same year produced the cries of a newborn infant in a rugged log cabin in Hardin County, Kentucky. What baby was that? Abraham Lincoln. If there had been news broadcasts at that time, no doubt these words would have been heard. The destiny of the world is being shaped on an Austrian battlefield today. But history was actually being shaped in the cradles of England and America. Similarly, everyone thought taxation was the big news when Jesus was born. But a young Jewish woman cradled the biggest news of all, the birth of the Savior. We all know, because it's been a big part of our studies, our series, that as these prophecies were being told, and even as Jesus was being born, that it was always done in a time, in a time of darkness, really. Uh, when Jesus was born, the Roman Empire was ruling over the land. And uh, they were, Jesus was born in Bethlehem because Caesar Augustus, the Roman ruler, said everybody needs to go back to their original cities and be counted so that they could be taxed. He wanted them to be re registered so that they could be taxed. No doubt, that's, that was the big news. Everybody was talking about that. Uh, don't make the mistake of thinking that at the time that Jesus was born, that everybody knew about it. Hardly anyone knew about it. We know that Herod himself missed Christmas altogether because he was focused on trying to eliminate this potential uh, rival to his own throne. And so there were many, many people that missed the birth of Jesus, missed that very first Christmas. 
And we have here in this passage, beginning at verse 22 down to verse 40, two people who did not miss the birth of Jesus. Although they were not there that day or that night or that moment when Jesus was born, they recognized him very soon after and praised God for that birth. And so we'll see tonight that the, these parents will get some confirmation of all of this through prophecy and then again through preaching. Let's look at verse 22. It says, now when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed. Whose purification? Mary's purification. Now, some of you have been here with me on Sundays a couple of months back when we were going through Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and uh, you might remember that there was when when the uh, the woman would give birth to a child uh, that there was a time of purification after that where she was to be left alone and she really wasn't going out anywhere it was just her and that baby and there was a, a n certain number of days in fact the days were it was 33 days for a boy a little bit longer for a girl but here's Mary uh, in the previous verse, which we're not reading right now, but we read it on Sunday. We find out that eight days after the birth of Jesus, so this is after the birth of Jesus, eight days after Jesus was taken and circumcised. That was what they did. At eight days old, they would circumcise the male children. But it says here now in verse 22, this is after that. Now, when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And uh, so back uh, uh, in um, Exodus chapter 13 and Leviticus chapter 12 explained this to us. This is actually 40 days after the birth of Jesus. So at this point, he's 40 days old. 40 days old obviously is not very old at all, right? Still an infant, still a precious little baby boy, uh, obviously helpless just because he was Jesus doesn't mean that he came out of the womb wearing a halo or glowing or, you know, cooking his own scrambled eggs. He still was very much dependent on his parents until he grew older. But they bring him as part of this ceremony to, to Jerusalem, so from from uh, Bethlehem to Jerusalem to the temple to present him to the Lord. In verse 23, it says, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. That's from Exodus 13. And in verse 24, to offer a sacrifice according to what, uh, to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So we learned some neat things about this. Number one, Mary and Joseph followed the law. They didn't say, well, we gave birth to Jesus and Jesus is getting rid of that old law junk. So we're not doing it either. No, they were living in obedience to the law. We are told, I believe it's in Galatians now, I forgot to write it down, but we're told that Jesus was born under the law. Here's Jesus. He's born. He's been circumcised according to the law. Now they're taking him to the temple to present him to God. And here's what's going on. The parents at this point, because uh, back in Exodus chapter 13, when uh, they were still in Egypt, not Jesus, not his parents, but when the, the Jews were still in Egypt, God had told them, listen, from now on, I want the firstborn child. And so what did that mean? Did that mean that the parents had to take their firstborn child to the local church and say, okay, God, here you go. And okay, priests, you're in charge of this little kid. There you go. You're welcome. No, what they did, this is a ceremony. What they did was they would take the child to the temple. That's what they're doing here. And they would ceremonially present that child to God. And they would say, God, this is my firstborn and this child belongs to you. Now, God didn't want for them to leave their kids there at the temple. So what he worked out was he worked out a ceremony where they would come and they would offer and they would pay it some money, pay an amount, but they would offer some animals in um, uh, to, to uh, as a symbol of, of those child. Basically, here's my son, but I'm offering him to you, God. He's yours, but I'm going to take him back with me. And in his place, I'm going to offer this animal sacrifice. And so they were obedient to the law. Another interesting fact here in verse 24, we're told that they brought a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Those were animals, those birds, those were allowed by God for families or people that could not afford a bigger animal, a lamb. 
So interesting. Um, I've said it before. I've mentioned it before. And some of you may know this, but Jesus and his mother, Mary, and his father, or I guess you might say his stepfather, so to speak, his earthly father, uh, they were, it was, they were, they were poor. They were a peasant. It was a peasant family. They could not afford to bring the same sacrifices that many others were. And so according to the law, they were allowed to bring these two turtle doves or two young pigeons, these two birds. So interesting, some interesting facts. But what happens is as they go to the temple, little baby Jesus being held in his mother's arms, or maybe Joseph was even being a good dad, a doting father and carrying baby Jesus. However, they first entered into the temple. Look at verse 25. And verse, beginning at verse 25 is where we see this prophecy. And what happens is that there's a man there who blesses God. But look at the story in verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout. Now it tells us, well, what does it mean, just and devout? Well, he was waiting for the consolation or the comfort of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. What does all that mean? The consolation of Israel or the comfort of Israel means that this man, this man Simeon, he was just and he was devout. In other words, he was devoted to God. Doesn't mean he was perfect. Doesn't mean that he came floating into the temple. We'll see in just a moment that he came by the Spirit. That doesn't mean that he was glowing or he was, you know, doing like a Luke Skywalker thing and, you know, sending his body over there or something. Uh, it means that he was filled with the Spirit, that he loved God with all of his heart. And when it says that he was waiting for the consolation of Israel or the comfort of Israel, it means that he was waiting for the appearance of Messiah, Jesus. Okay? And so he's actually in the temple. And in verse 26, it says, And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ or the Lord's Messiah. So the Holy Spirit at some point in the past in Simeon's life had actually told Simeon, Hey, I know you really, you know, you're, you're waiting for uh, the Messiah to show up and, and, and offer salvation. The Holy Spirit actually told this man, Simeon, you are not going to die until you, with your own eyes, see the Messiah. You're not going to die. That's pretty wild. Can you imagine? God speaks to you and tells you you're not going to die until this happens. You know, you might feel like, man, I can just go run across the freeway or something. I'm invincible. You know, nothing's going to happen to me. Simeon was told that he would not die until he had seen the Messiah. Now here he is in Jerusalem, and the parents are in Jerusalem, and they've got Jesus in Jerusalem, and they're going into the temple. So in verse 27 it says, so when he came by the Spirit into the temple, that just means, again, he wasn't floating or invisible, or it wasn't in a spiritual sense. It means that he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit was leading him into the temple. So in verse 27, so he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law. They're coming in. They're obeying the law. They're coming with their, their birds. And they're going to offer their son, Jesus, to God according to the law. And they're going to offer a sacrifice. Well, at that point in verse 28, check this out. There's Simeon. He took him up in his arms and blessed God and said. This is kind of strange. I mean, it sounds real holy and it sounds, oh, this is so neat because it's in the Bible. But again, we put ourselves in this in the place. So we're not in a temple, let's, but let's just say that you come to church. Now, let's say that it's a few years from now. You're married. You married your high school sweetheart. And now you've got a brand new baby. And you're coming to church with that brand new baby the first time. It's been fun over the years to uh, watch, you know, brand new parents. They come in with their baby and they're so careful. Like, oh, this baby's going to break, you know. And, you know, sometimes they're like, no, we, you know, hey, I haven't seen you guys at church for a while. I know, you know, we're waiting until the baby's five before we bring him to church, you know, because we don't want anybody to breathe on him. <laughs> You know, but, but let's say, you know, your young parents come and let's say that you come in and you're married and you got this brand, brand new beautiful baby and you're coming to the church. And, and what we do here is we present babies to the Lord also. We call it dedication. You dedicate your child. And what will happen is you go up on the stage with Pastor John and he takes that beautiful baby in his arms and he'll pray and present that, that child to the Lord. 
you don't leave the child here, okay? You make sure you take that child with you, right? But let's say that you're doing that. Let's say that you show up, and then as you're walking up to church, some old man that you have never seen before in your life goes, hey, give me that baby, and just takes that baby. There's no way, right? You, you might, uh, you know, he starts reaching for your baby, you might start reaching for your weapon, your gun or your knife or something, or ready to fight this guy. Like, who are, what are you doing? You know, what are you, why are you touching my baby? Why are you reaching for my baby? But as these two young parents come in, this baby Jesus, all, I mean, imagine all of these things, the prophecies they've heard, all that's gone on. And now they're kind of waiting. You know, they've got baby Jesus. They know what God said. They know what the angel said. They know who this baby is and who he's going to become as he grows older and all of this. stuff. And then they walk into the temple and they're just kind of minding their own business. Lots of people there. You know, there's hustle and bustle, lots of things going on, and they're coming in, and all of a sudden, this old man just appears from the crowd and scoops up that baby, takes that baby in his arms. And he says here, in verse 29, Lord, he doesn't talk to the parents. He doesn't talk to baby baby Jesus. You know, usually grab a baby, you know, oh, hey, little baby, you know, Gucci Koo or whatever you say to kids, I don't know, you know, you, uh, you, you talk to us. It's so funny um, being around, you know, my wife or my girls or whatever, and they hold a baby and they, they have, you know, baby talk. And, you know, it's like, why are you talking to the kid like that? You know, uh, but anyways, this is before I go off. So, so verse 29, he picks up this baby and he starts talking to the Lord. He says, Lord, now you are letting your servant, your servant, he's talking about himself, depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Incredible. See, the parents are getting confirmation here through this old man, Simeon, old guy scooping up this baby before they know what's going on and he begins to talk to the Lord right in front of them and says Lord and and what's going on here is that Simeon is praising God because God is fulfilling his promise remember God the Holy Spirit had told Simeon you're not going to die until you see the Messiah and now he's in the temple and he sees the, the baby, but this is the Messiah. This is the Savior. Simeon sees him. The Spirit speaks to his heart and says, that's the one. That's the Messiah. That's, that's him. And he scoops him up, and he's so excited, and he begins to praise God. And then he actually says in verse 29, you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. Ah, now I can die in peace, he says. He's so excited that he's seen the hope. And now he can leave and he can go to heaven because he knows God's, God's doing his thing and God's brought the Messiah and, and God's offering salvation. And so he says, I'm, I'm ready to go. It reminds me of my old friend Jeff that works here at the church, old guy. Probably none of you would know him, but he's always talking about the bonus, the bonus, the bonus. The bonus, what is that? The bonus, he wants to die and go to heaven. And he's like, man, I just want to get the bonus. And I keep teasing him. I tell him, nah. You're not going to die. He's an old guy. He's got some medical problems. I keep telling him, nah, you're not going to die anytime soon, man. I always tell him, I tell him, you know what? I'm praying that the rest of us will die first and you're going to be the you're going to be the last one here. And he's like, oh, I can't believe you. You know, I thought you were my friend, you know, but he's just, he's got this desire to just go to heaven and go be with the Lord. And this is Simeon. Simeon's like, okay, that's it. I've seen Jesus. I've seen the Messiah. I'm ready to die. Incredible events. This confirmation that the parents are getting even after the birth of Jesus. He doesn't stop there, though. He says in verse 31, he says, which, still talking, let me pick it up from verse 30. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples. It's, it's out in the open. A light to bring revelation to the Gentiles. Now, this is incredible stuff here. Gentiles, in case you do not know, are people who are not Jews. Uh, you've got, you know, you can break people up into lots of different groups. You know, ages, gender, uh, uh, height, whatever, all, all sorts of different things. But as far as God is concerned, there are two different kinds of people. There are Jews and there are Gentiles. Gentiles is not a bad word or a bad name. It's just a name for people who are not Jews. 
And I love that Simeon here, as he's blessing God and he's prophesying, the first thing that he mentions, the first group of people that he mentions is the Gentiles. I love this because I'm a Gentile. I'm not a Jew. And whenever I've asked in here, is anybody a Jew? I've never had anybody say, yes, I'm a Jew. So my assumption is, although there may be somebody in here who's a Jew, but my assumption is that you're all Gentiles. You're not Jews. Well, good news. Simeon says in verse 32 that Messiah, Jesus, was bringing a light to the Gentiles. We need the light. Gentiles, people, just in general, we need the light. But he does also mention the Jews here in verse 32, and the glory of your people Israel. So both Gentiles and Jews or Israel, they're going to experience this, the, the, um, this, this marvelous gift. Verse 33, and Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. But Simeon wasn't done yet because he starts by blessing God. But now what he does in verses 34 and 35 is that he blesses Mary and Joseph. He turns his attention to the parents and he says, then Simeon blessed them in verse 34 and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel. In other words, this child is going to be a troublemaker, so to speak. So this child is going to be the cause of many people falling, but also many people rising. In other words, some radical things are about to happen through the life of your son, Mary, behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against, verse 35, yes, in parentheses, a sword will pierce through your own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. So in other words, through Jesus, some, some radical things are going to happen. In other words, people are going to get saved. They're going to rise. Some people are going to reject, they will fall. But also Mary, she would experience a sword that would pierce through her own soul also when she would watch, she would be there to watch her son, Jesus, this little beautiful little baby boy, grow up about the, about the age of 33, 33 and a half, be nailed to a cross and, and die up there publicly in front of everybody. That the hearts of men, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. In other words, Jesus was going to reveal the thoughts of, of everyone's hearts. The sweetest people, some of the sweetest people that we know have rejected Jesus. And they may be the sweetest people that we know, but we understand what's going on in their heart. They do not have a need, or at least they don't know that they have a need for the Messiah. And yet, some of the nastiest people that we have ever known, we find out what's in their heart when they surrender their life to Jesus because they see a need. Remember the thief on the cross when he was dying next to Jesus? And he got saved at the last moment. Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. So, Jesus was going to reveal the thoughts of everyone's hearts. Well, there's another way that uh, the parents get confirmation here uh, during this time. At verse 36, they get it through preaching. So there's confirmation that comes from uh, prophecy and now confirmation that comes through preaching. Verse 36, and there will be some prophecy in this also, but verse 36 says, now there was one Anna, look at this, you ladies will love this, a prophetess. In other words, she was a prophet. She was a female prophet, a prophetess. We don't get to see that very often, but there were some. And so there was this one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the, that not, not Manuel, but Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, another elderly person and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. 
And this woman in verse 37 was a widow of about 84 years. In other words, what those two numbers tell us is that she had been a widow for a long time and, that, and basically that she was an elderly lady. That's what it's telling us there. In verse 37, look how she was living. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. This is the type of lady that was just always at the temple, or we might know people that are just always at church. Every time the doors are open, somebody's there. I think of uh, some of you know Josh Walker. He's just always here. And uh, I'll be here late sometimes, and, and then I'll come, you know, leave, leave in my office or whatever. I'm walking through, and I'll see Josh there, and uh, he'll, be, he'll be helping, like, cleaning the bathrooms or sweeping or whatever. He'll be helping uh, Irvin or, uh, or Axel. It's just, and, that's, and that's after he's worked his day job, and then he comes over here and volunteers more time. He's just always here. Every time the doors are open, he'll be here Saturday, probably for all three services. He'll be back on Sunday morning for Christmas service. Uh, no doubt he's in the sanctuary tonight. He's just always here. Every time the doors are open, he's here. If there's men's study going on, he'll help for that. Or if there's a women's study going on, he'll help with whatever he can help with. Always here. But I have known some ladies over the years too. Some of you might know Jo Lynn, who's here. It's like she's always here. And she's always kind of in the background. Most of you probably don't know who in the world she is, but she works with children's ministry. And you'll see her just pushing her cart through and she's just you know, restocking things for children's ministry. And then she's, you know, I just saw her again here tonight. I'm always kind of moving around all over the place and we're always saying hi to each other. Oh, there you are again. Oh, there you are again. Oh, there you are again. Just always here. I think of a dear friend of mine named Abby. I knew her for many years. She's now gone home. She's in heaven. She's with the Lord. But she was just always, every time there was something going on in church, she was there. Elderly lady. She was always helping out. Fantastic artist. And she would do these, these pieces of, of art, uh, like biblical artwork on the walls of the children's ministry rooms. Uh, incredible, like a full on, like a, a Goliath cartoon style. And, you know, and there's Goliath, you know, with his big old sword and David with his little, uh, you know, sling. And it was just incredible artwork. And, but she was just always there, faithful woman, always there. This woman, Anna, she is that way. It says in verse 37 that she did not leave the temple. She's just always there. Now, no doubt she left. She had her own home and went to go eat or whatever. But basically, she's just always there worshiping. And it says at the end of verse 37 that she served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant... So I don't know exactly at what point this happened. Uh, Simeon has, you know, is holding this baby. And it says here in verse 38, and coming in that instant. So I don't know if Simeon was actually still holding baby Jesus and he's prophesying and doing his thing. And then in verse 38, coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him, that's Jesus, to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So she comes in. She sees this brand new little baby and evidently God speaks to her heart and says, that's the Messiah. And then this prophetess begins to preach. She begins to preach. She begins to prophesy and tell everybody that's there, this is the Messiah. Imagine that. I mean, imagine for just a moment, an elderly lady, a very old lady. She, you, you know, you, you see her in church and she's pointing at some little baby and saying, hey, everybody, this is the Messiah. This is Jesus. This is the Messiah. What would you think? <laughs> Crazy old lady. <laughs> and no doubt, a lot of people in the temple thought, huh, what are you talking about? They probably looked at baby Jesus. Probably looked at his parents like, these two? That's the Messiah? Please. And we wonder again, like we did on Sunday, we talked about this. I wonder how many people missed Jesus that day. Imagine. What do you mean the Messiah, the Messiah was in the temple? What are you talking about? I was there. I didn't see the Messiah. Yeah, because he wasn't glowing. He wasn't like baby Yoda, you know, just floating across the desert or, you know, he, 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 was, he was being held by his parents. They didn't know they looked at his parents. These are peasants. They don't even have a, a lamb to offer. They're coming in. They got birds. 
Come on. Because he wasn't in a shiny package. Because he wasn't being thronged by a, a, a royal ensemble. There was no parade for him. Nobody blowing horns and announcing. It's just these two elderly people. What an incredible thought. That these two people saw Jesus saw that precious little baby and knew that he was the Messiah. And she begins to preach to everybody, this lady. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. You're looking for redemption in Jerusalem? This is our hope, she was saying to them. And so we finish in verses 39 and 40. So when they had performed all these all, all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Of course, it was. And that concludes our, our Christmas series. But as we finish tonight, before we break in just a moment to go to, uh, uh, we're going to break for in just a moment to go to small groups. Let me ask you something. Let me ask you something. You know Jesus. Now, you've not seen him with your own eyes, but you know Jesus. And you've seen, you, you know that he's real because you've seen the proof of Jesus in your own life, maybe in the lives of your friends or your family members. You know, hey, this, this, obviously God is working in this person. So what about you and I? Are we like Simeon and Anna? Are we proclaiming Jesus to other people. You see, this coming Saturday and Sunday, Christmas Eve, Christmas morning, we'll gather with family. And no doubt you have some family members that they don't want to hear all that religion stuff. You may have some family that are like, wait, you're going to church this Sunday morning? Yeah, well, you know, it's Christmas. Yeah, but it's Sunday. I mean, come on, it's Christmas morning. I thought we were going to get together, we we're going to open presents and, you know, do the, do the whole thing. Well, yeah, we'll do that, but we're going to do a little bit later because we're going to church. And there may be some people in your family that are looking at you like, you're crazy, man. Like, what's wrong with you? Isn't it strange how often we leave Jesus out of Christmas? It's his birthday. Isn't that strange? If it was your birthday, it's, when it's your birthday, it's all about you. Everybody sits down. They sing the, the dumb uh, birthday song to you. You got to just sit there and look at everybody all awkward. I love doing that to people. My kids hate it. It's like, I know you hate it. So let's do it. Let's sing it again, you know. Just sit there and look at us, you know. But, but you know, all, all the attention's on you. Why would it be any different this coming Sunday? Why would it be any different on, on Christmas? We're celebrating his birthday. He's the birthday boy in a sense. So let's bring him up. Let's be like Simeon and Anna. And what did Anna do here? And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Why not speak about Jesus to everybody that's looking for or in need of redemption, saving? How else are they going to get it? But through Jesus, that's it. So let's take their example this coming weekend. And say, you know what? Hey, it's all about Jesus, man. And let's give him glory. Father, thank you so much for tonight and for your word.